Hey class, Adam Ward here. Uh, we are going to continue talking about external flows and focus in this lecture on form drag and empirical drag coefficients. Um, and so you'll remember that as we introduce these concepts of lift and drag, we had an equation that looks something like this, where our drag force is a function of a drag coefficient, cd, multiplied by one half times the fluid density, velocity squared, and then the area. So we're going to continue to focus on this um, equation, looking at the drag coefficient. Uh, and in particular, in this lecture, we're going to focus on form drag or pressure drag. Um, so that result of imperfect flow where we get separation of the boundary layer. So uh, I wanted to start with just sort of a, a simple visualization here for smooth nosed bodies. Um, so you can see on the bottom there's a sphere that's moving through a fluid. Um, on the left hand side you have a laminar boundary layer. So we get laminar over here and on the right hand side you get this turbulent boundary layer. Uh, and what I wanted to show you is that despite as uh, the way that sometimes tables and textbooks look extremely simple Here's a shape, here's a singular value for the drag coefficient. It's often not that easy. Um, so when we have extremely slow flows and there is no separation, uh, so you're only getting that friction drag shown in the green portion of this graph, um, you do have this variability in the drag, the effective drag coefficient. As you move into the region with laminar separation, um, things approximately level out, and again, over here in turbulent separation, they approximately level out. And so what this means is we need to understand, do we have flow separation happening, yes or no? And if we do, is the boundary layer laminar or turbulent when that flow separates? Right? So there's a, a series of questions we need to ask ourselves to identify the correct drag coefficient. And if we get over here where there's separation, um, just to remind you, it's not only that you have form drag, it's friction drag plus that separation. So if we're thinking about two-dimensional objects, um, this might be relevant because you are looking, say that you're looking in plan view down at a bridge pier um, that's sticking down through a fluid, for example. Um, some things to notice here, right? So one, in that top image, you can see that I've provided both a typical value for a laminar and a turbulent uh, separation. So you have to understand that flowing condition. And again, there are lookup tables. These are first estimates, but these are imperfect values. Um, but it's a good first start. Highlighted in red here, the idea that streamlining matters. So as we change the ratio of length to diameter, D or distance across, capital D, um, not only do we have laminar and turbulent separation, but you can see that the streamlining of that shape, so the, the bottom of that table, the wider and wider that shape gets, um, reduces your drag coefficients. And perhaps unsurprisingly to you, uh, highlighted in purple, the exact same shape, if you turn it to a different orientation to the flow, you'll produce different drag coefficients. So what I'm wanting you to see here is sort of all these considerations that you've got to weigh in your mind as you pick a drag coefficient for your problem. Is it laminar or turbulent boundary layer? What's the aspect ratio? Have we changed the shape? Have we turned the shape? Is the fluid going to intersect with that shape at a different angle? These also tend to play out in 3D. So for sharp edged bodies, um, so bodies that do not have rounded edges but, but instead have the um, sort of sharp, the sharp edge points, um, that tends to cause a characteristic separation of the boundary layer. Um, and so those will be approximately constant once you get above a Reynolds number of about uh, 10,000. Again, just like in 2D, um, if you've got a smooth body, you're going to have at least two drag coefficients, one for laminar and one for turbulent separation. Uh, and as shown by these bicyclists, um, your streamlining matters. So whether you are like the bicyclist on top sitting straight up on your bike or whether you are tucked down into a race position, um, notice that you're not changing the mass of that cyclist but you are changing the frontal area that the fluid sees 
and you're changing the drag coefficient. So it's both a change in area and a change in the effective drag coefficient. That's why streamlining is so important. So as an example, um, we're going to look at settling of a sphere. So what you see on the bottom left is a sedimentation basin. And the idea here is that stormwater and the soil that it carries, the sediment particles it carries, come into the basin. And we want to design this basin so that the grains of sediment can settle out to the bottom before water would flow out. So we're going to consider what happens to a one millimeter diameter grain of sand with the given density settling through water with this given viscosity. And the question here is what is the terminal settling velocity? So in other words, how fast do we expect these grains of sand to be settling? And so to do this, we're going to analyze a grain using a force balance. So shown here as a, a perfect sphere is a sand grain. And the forces we're going to need to think about um, that grain is below water, it's displacing fluid, so we've got a buoyant force, Fb. Of course, gravity is acting on that grain, so we've got a weight force pulling down. Uh, and then finally shown in green here is an upward drag force. Right? And so the grain is moving down through the fluid, and so drag is resisting that motion. So I've drawn the drag in the upward direction here. So at its terminal velocity, meaning it's no longer accelerating, that's a condition where these forces have all come into balance with one another, and that's the approach we'll take to solve this problem. All right, so again, the grain is settling down, therefore the drag is acting up. So let's write out our force balance in the vertical. So the sum of the forces is zero, the weight force minus the drag minus the buoyancy. Okay. And again, just to underscore here, at terminal velocity, there is no acceleration. That's how we get sum of the forces equals zero. So let's go ahead and write in what we know. And you'll see the first term I've written in, um, highlighted with the green, is weight. So uh, mass times acceleration, or density times volume, and then acceleration due to gravity, g. The second term highlighted in red, that's our drag force, the same equation I wrote on the very first slide of this lecture. And then the final term with the purple is the buoyant force, uh, and you'll remember that's the mass of fluid displaced, so we're using the density of water, rho w, in that right hand most term. So if we're going to make the assumption this is a perfect sphere, um, we can actually substitute in some knowledge. We know the area of a circle is pi over 4 times its diameter squared. And we know the volume of that sphere is pi over 6 times its diameter cubed. So if we substitute those in and rearrange for what we're actually trying to solve, that velocity v, we get an equation that looks something like this. All right, and so up in the numerator, we've got 4 times the density difference between the solid and the fluid being displaced, multiplied by gravity times diameter, and down in the denominator, three times that drag coefficient times the density of water. So you can go ahead and do the algebra to prove it to yourself um, that we can get to this equation. So the question here becomes, what values do we have? What values do we need? And the biggest unknown in this case is that drag coefficient. We were given everything else. So there's a few approaches. Um, we have some tables that give us idealized values. If we know that it's a laminar separation or a turbulent separation, uh, we have a typical value. Um, we also have more complicated values that we'll look at in a moment. So the workflow here is going to be that we're going to make an assumption if the boundary layer separation is laminar or turbulent we can actually do our calculation of terminal velocity, calculate that Reynolds number, and ask ourselves, was it actually laminar? If the answer is yes, we made a good assumption and we're done. If the answer is no, we would repeat the process with the turbulent value. Um, that's the simplest thing to do, grab a typical value from a table. Just to give you a sense of the complexity of these drag coefficients, I want to look at a slightly more complicated approach on the next slide. And so 
Here is a chart out of our textbook. And this shows us the drag coefficient for spheres. So this is only for perfect spheres. And you can see this looks sort of like the Moody diagram, right? In that you've got the Reynolds number on the x-axis. Uh, you have different lines that represent relative roughness. So you see the epsilon over diameter again. Um, and then the left-hand y-axis is the drag coefficient, right? That's the CD that you would read off of the chart to use in our, uh, in our problem. So the solid line here is for a smooth sphere, so there's no roughness. Uh, we'll assume that that's what we're working with because we weren't given any other information. And what I wanted to show you then is the value of about 0 0.5 that you can find in a table, that simple form. Uh, what's actually been done here is for the range of Reynolds numbers where we're typically getting laminar boundary layers, um, 0.5 has been picked as an approximation. It's not truly 0.5, of course, as you move from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of that region, you get slight increases. But again, as a first cut, as a starting point, a value of 0.5 is not bad. So let's bring that equation back and proceeding with a value of 0.5 for the drag coefficient, we can go, we have that four out front, 2,000 kilograms per cubic meter is the density of the sediment that was given, minus 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, density of water, multiply that by gravity, and we know the grain was one millimeter, so we'll go ahead and convert that into meters. Down in the denominator, constant three, multiplied by the drag coefficient of 0 0.5 that we looked up in the table, and the density of water, so I calculate a settling velocity of about 0.16 meters per second for this sediment grain. Now, we're not quite done yet. We want to make sure our laminar assumption was correct. So we'll take our Reynolds number. If our settling is at 0.16 meters per second, multiplied by our diameter of one millimeter, and again, I'm using a unit conversion there to get it into meters to make my number truly unitless viscosity down in the denominator, uh, and by my calculation we end up with a Reynolds number of about 150. Uh, that's substantially lower than the threshold for a turbulent boundary layer, and so we do have laminar separation, we feel good about our assumption, we're done. All right, so the goal of this lecture um, was just to help you understand some of what has to go into your mind when you're deciding what drag coefficient to use. Um, we need to know about laminar versus turbulent boundary layers, and we need to know something about the shape. Um, if that boundary layer is likely to have a constant value or a continuously variable value, depending on um, the Reynolds number. So. I'm going to follow this up with one more lecture where we'll look at drag coefficients and bicyclists. Uh, thanks for sticking with me, and I'll see you in the next lecture momentarily.